Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is Self Made Man, the podcast for men who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of their lives. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. You know, there are very few times in life when you get the opportunity to learn from the best, but today we have that chance. Chris Saka has become known as the single greatest venture capitalist in the world over the past few years. In 2010, he opened his first venture fund called Lowercase Capital and raised $8.4 million. And he would go on to invest that money in a handful of startups that were virtually unknown at the time. A few of them were called Twitter, Instagram, and Uber. His decisions would turn that $8.4 million into a fund that's now valued at over $1.3 billion dollars at the age of 39. Well, today you're going to find out how he did it. We're going to talk about his philosophy when it comes to family, charity, and raising kids. And we're also going to get the inside scoop on how he ended up on Shark Tank. Please help me welcome Chris Saka. Welcome back, everybody. Today we are joined by an incredibly special guest, Mr. Chris Saka. So Chris, welcome to Self Made Man. I'm so excited to have you here today with us. It's very cool to be here. Thanks, Mike. Absolutely. So you're really known as one of the most successful venture capitalists out there today uh, with early stage investments. You've got uh, investments in companies with Twitter, Uber, Instagram, Kickstarter, Blue Bottle Coffee. What's occurred to me is you really understand what sets successful entrepreneurs and businesses apart from you know, those that aren't. And today we've got a couple of hundred thousand entrepreneurs who are going to be listening to this and who are out there seeking to create value in the world, who want to make an impact. So first and foremost, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today to share your wisdom. And I can't wait to to really just dive into your experiences, what you've learned, and you know, for you and I to, to provide some value here today that will help people uh, take their businesses to the next level. So thank you so much. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm psyched there's even platforms like this. Kind of growing up in this industry, you know, pre-blogging, pre-podcast, there was really not any great way for this kind of knowledge transfer other than maybe reading the old industry standard or red herring, the old magazines, you'd maybe see a quick Q&A or if you could maybe get in the room for a panel discussion somewhere uh, at a conference. But it's been really fun to see the emergence of, of content like yours that really pays it forward, I think. And, and also just the geographic distribution. I think we've seen entrepreneurship, particularly in tech, become less about Silicon Valley and New York and start to really spread across the country and across the globe. So I love stuff like this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really interesting. I was reading the, the credo on your website over at low, lowercasecapital.com and your mission and your approach to, to business and to venture capital and why you really started your, your company and your fund. And I thought it was quite interesting. It really, at least for me and what I read, out of a desire to bring authenticity to that world where it wasn't just about you know bottom line profits and money, that's part of it, but it's more about helping entrepreneurs. It's a much more collaborative uh, you know, approach to investing in businesses. And I was wondering if you could share a few minutes on how you came about that approach and how it served you. Yeah. I, I mean... I appreciate that that jumped out at you. I just want to say it's not necessarily rooted in altruism. You know, I think what's been funny is as I've gone through my career, I have found that you can often balance the good stuff, frankly, with with greed, actually. Um, they're, they're often totally aligned. I mean, I'll speak just for a second. You know, what we now know is that diverse companies, racially diverse and gender diverse companies outperform monoculture companies. And so it's been fun as a progressive to say, hey, look, we need to fight for diversity. But it's also funny how that just aligns with greed. If you want to make more money, if you don't have an allergy to cash, you should probably start focusing on diversity within your hiring. And so going back to the founding of my firm, I realized that it's one thing to give lip service to, hey, we're you know pro entrepreneur and we love founders and all that. And, I'll, and you'll find that on a lot of people's websites. But for me, it was that I was starting to see a correlation between the empowerment of the engineer or the true entrepreneur founder versus the MBA bullshit artists who are kind of floating above them. You know, Web 1.0 and the big bubble back in 99, 2000 was mostly about 
storytellers and and less about builders. It was mostly about bankers and less about engineers and product people. And I think that's one of the reasons why it it cratered so badly. If you fast forward to 2004, five, six, you you start to see the rise of Y Combinator, for instance, in the startup school. And what we saw as a result were that engineers were being empowered to build their companies. And we were taking more and more of the fluff out of the business. Uh, We were taking the business plan necessity out of the business instead just saying, show us your code. And structurally to change such that it didn't cost much to write code. It would have in 99, you would have had to have a proprietary Sun environment or Oracle system and your database stuff and your internet connection was expensive and you need to rent a rack in a, in a data center. And as everything went to open source and to, to manage hosting and, uh, and then to kind of the AWS Google engine of the world, finally it was just, can you on your laptop with your home internet connection start writing code? And so there was a great democratization of this space. And what I found along the way was that, you know, it's one thing to be a trader. And I'm sure you got you have people in your audience here who are stock traders. I tried that and I wasn't that bad at it. But when things were going red, I would just yell at the screen. There was nothing I could do to impact it. And so what I found was selfishly, the best way for me to guarantee that I was going to make a bunch of money as an investor was to get my hands on stuff. And to start showing up at the company and personally impacting the outcome. And so when I wrote my first check into Twitter, you know, Jack didn't invite me to stop by the office. I just showed up and and invited myself in and started getting my mitts into stuff. And he wasn't thrilled by that. But I was like, look, this is this is 25 grand and I need this back someday. At the time, that was very material money for me. And so that's what I found is that selfishly. I just knew that I could have some impact on these companies. And so that was going to be my approach rather than, so it didn't, it didn't come out of a, you know, just kind of giving lip service to it. It's real. And that's, that's how we make money here is by getting involved. You know, we were, before we, we jumped into this interview, we were, we were swapping stories about some things that we have in common, our trips to Necker Island and, and our involvement with Charity Water and and Scott. And two parts to, to your story around both of those were the fact that you mentioned you didn't necessarily have the money at the time to, you know, contribute to either in the way that you would have liked to, which for me says you've got a natural comfort level, probably more than most with risk. And two, you're also confident in the eventual outcome. And I was wondering if you could share some more on that. Yeah, there's a bunch of fun themes in there. I mean, look, Charity Water means so much to me. It's it, it's the most efficient and effective and accountable charity in the world, uh, partly because of the software they built that tracks each of the dollars you give into the field and shows directly the impact it has for each village. And you and I are both members of a group called The Well, and we fund all the overhead for Charity Water so that everybody else listening here who donates money, all their money has direct impact. I love that model and I feel really lucky to be involved there. But yeah, in the early days when Scott Harrison, the founder, came up with The Well, you know, it was going to have a relatively high ticket price to join. And I initially discouraged him because I didn't have any money to join. And I felt I'd be really left out. Uh, luckily, business has taken a good turn for me and I have an opportunity to join. Similarly, Necker Island, where you and I sound like we both had some adventures. That's Richard Branson's island. In the early days, I was always an invited guest, a guest of Richard or somebody else, because I, I couldn't pay to be there. It's a ridiculously expensive vacation. But the one thing I always brought to bear and the reason why Richard would invite me year after year was because I could make it more interesting. I, I grew up with a really interesting background. I, My mom and dad made sure that we always had really crappy jobs growing up as well as exposure to some white collar type internships even at a young age. I had lived and studied and traveled and worked abroad for a lot of my life. I had made a regular point out of playing sports and taking on adventures and rode my bike across the country. And I would do all this crazy stuff along the way that I think just made me an interesting person to hang out with. And I also made it a mission of mine to help people like Richard Branson, who didn't quite understand the Internet yet, get smart on the Internet. And as a result, I became kind of indispensable to these folks. And and I, I say that because it's one of the things that made my business possible later on was that a lot of these folks were my earliest investors or at least even allies of the firm I started. 
where long, long before I needed anything from them, I started trying to add value to their, to their businesses. I have a, I have a friend, uh, with whom I collaborated to be the, we bought up all the Twitter shares we could find and, um, we're ultimately owned over 15% of the company at the IPO. And he was a guy I had advised. I had for free for years. He'd never been an LP in my fund and he had owned some media assets and he was trying to understand the digital space. So I used to fly down to LA and help him understand that stuff for free. And I created a lot of value there. So when the time came to build a big project together and our skills were very complementary to each other, it was just a no brainer. That's the same way I ended up with my partner, Matt Mazio, who runs lowercase day to day. Now I, I stepped back a couple of years and Matt runs the firm, but Matt was just an incredibly interesting guy. I met him in a jam session late night in Gary V's hotel room at South by Southwest in like 2005 or 2006. Fascinating guy, you know, a guy who grew up without any money, went to high school and scholarship and then went to Harvard and, you know, was spent time uh, after Katrina in New Orleans. I mean, just this, again, an adventure oriented guy who had stories for days. And ultimately when I hired him to take over our firm, uh, there wasn't any job interview process. I just called him and said, you know, I've known you for years. You've been adding value. You've been bringing folks into our portfolio companies and helping me discover portfolio companies I didn't know about. And so here's the offer and I'd love to have you join. I think that's a common thread there is that when you, you know, one of the guys of your podcast, the self-made man, I think there's a real opportunity for all of us out there to author our own story. And it doesn't require a bunch of money and it doesn't even require a bunch of connections in the beginning. You know, I gave a graduation speech once where I, I focused on one of the keys being interestingness. And I think interestingness is something you can actually achieve rather than uh, have it be innate. And so I really encourage everyone listening to go out and try and become interesting. And I think that happens by traveling. I think it happens by working with people who are a lot less fortunate than you are. I think it happens by just showing up and asking if you can be helpful before anyone can pay you back. And certainly I think it, it depends on being willing to take a little risk and get outside your comfort zone. But people like that are just magnetic and good things end up happening. Yeah, agreed. You, uh, you have a quote attributed to you somewhere that I came across and, uh, and prepped for this. And it's ironically, uh, a quote that I put in my very first book I wrote back in my twenties in 2005, which is basically, you have to be willing to give without want before you can get. Yeah. You just said it better than I did. Yeah. Basically <laughs> yeah. just create value before you ask for value, but yours is more elegant. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's something that, you know, going back to the startup investing, by the time I wrote the check to Twitter, I'd already been helping Twitter. By the time I wrote the check to Photo Bucket, my first, uh, my first angel investment, I'd already been rolling up my sleeves helping them. Uber, my wife and I spent six months with Travis and, and Garrett on Uber before they ever raised a dime. Jam sessions, trialing the product out, making design recommendations, brainstorming the name and the service and all that kind of stuff from the earliest days. And so in each of those cases, when it, came time to raise the money, you know, we were already there and it, it just wasn't even a, a question of whether we'd be investors because we had already established ourselves as helpers. That's awesome. Yeah, I, That's I a mean, huge the, insight. The email I got from Evan Williams on, on Twitter wasn't like, Hey, we're building this thing that blah, blah, blah. And we hope that you'll figure out that it's a big business. It, it literally was like a two line email saying, Hey, we're finally putting the round together. Can I put you down for 25 K? Okay, good. I got you down for 25. See you later. Because by then, we'd been active users, we'd brainstormed stuff, we'd worked on it, we'd brought other people onto the platform. And so that's a model that has worked really well for us. That's awesome. Huge, huge insight there. You know, one of the common themes of, of this show is the fact that most entrepreneurs, and I include myself in this category, when you're first starting out, you're bootstrapping your business. One of the first skills that you have to master is sales. And we all typically learn how to effectively sell our product or service, you know, or we wouldn't be in business otherwise. And what I found is that that skill set is completely the opposite from the skill set required to, you know, take that business from, let's say, $5 million in revenue beyond that you, when you get into the scaling side of things. My understanding of that process is it's much more focused on on leadership uh, at that point. And aside from a couple of books that you know we've all read and and heard about uh, potentially, 
learning that particular skill set, I'm still always looking for for guidance or advice on on how to do that. And I was wondering if you had any any suggestions. I think where sales breaks down is when you can just tell somebody doesn't believe in what they're selling. And you know, I'm sure there are a lot of folks on the in your audience right now who are like, "Damn, I'm pushing this pharma drug that I you know I feel trapped. I'm on a treadmill, and and you know I'm not going to make this quarter or whatever." And it's just because it breaks down the authenticity of it. And human beings aren't, you, know, you should never underestimate them. They can, they can tell when you're selling something you don't really believe in. The same goes for trying to sell yourself. People can tell when you have self-doubt, when you're trying to show up to a job interview or put in your resume and they can just smell it. And it's funny, there's a dynamic that I think even starts with us in junior high when you, when you ask somebody out on a date for the first time. You know, if you're desperate and tripping all over yourself, you rarely get the date. If you buy the flowers and the chocolate and write the poetry, you're not going to get the date. The best date ends up happening when you say, look, and you're candid. I think you're cute. I'd love to, to, to take you to the dance. But on the other hand, you know, I've got some buddies I can go with on Friday. And so I don't necessarily need this. And that's the allure. And it starts early in our lives. We learn that and we carry it all the way through the rest of our careers. Ultimately, and the very best entrepreneur pitches I've ever seen. And I'll use Kevin's sister at Instagram as an example. Kevin talked to me about photos and the reality was I didn't think I was ever going to make any money in photos again because I'd already made money in photos with photo bucket. We'd had a pretty big exit for its day and we were pretty confident that that was it. And I, I say this in all humility. I was not convinced. I know it sounds stupid now in retrospect, but I was not convinced that photo sharing alone was necessarily going to be a huge thing. I thought they would be attached as a payload to other stuff. I know I'm stupid, but back then Kevin pitched me this thing. And the nature of his pitch was such that it wasn't like, gee, man, I really need you to be involved. I mean, we're not going to get anywhere without you. Instead, he came and said, look, here's why I think this product is great. Early traction has been wonderful. You know, here's what I think distinguishes it from other stuff. Here's why people think it's an easier way to express themselves than the pressure of writing 140 characters. Here's what I think specifically you could be helpful with. I'm only approaching you and two other angels. He went after me, Jack Dorsey, and Adam D'Angelo, the the early Facebook and Quora guy. And he said, and here, and, and here's why. And then he said, at one point he said, and so when we get to 50 million users, that'll be a good time to roll out this other thing. And I said, stop, stop right there for a second. I was like, Kevin, you're, you're like a two person team sitting in this incubator late at night. There's nobody else here working. It's like 50 million users. It was an unprecedented scale, but he wasn't there to convince me. He just knew it. He literally knew it. And I left that meeting with a handshake to invest. Similarly, when you talk to Travis in the earliest days of Uber, he knew how big it was going to be. We all did, frankly. That one wasn't like Instagram. I didn't get talked into it. With, with Uber, we all knew how big it was going to be. Even when Travis was still staying in hostels and even when San Francisco utilities uh, and traffic enforcement was trying to impound our cars. And even when we had to change the domain name you know, virtually overnight from Uber Cab to Uber. And even when, as, as time has gone on and Korea has shut down Uber and France, you know, they start burning our cars over there. We always just knew how big this was going to be. And Travis wouldn't waste his time trying to convince you. What you got when you spoke with him was a real confidence that it was going to be that big someday. And I think that's something that applies not just to founding your startup, but as you sell yourself into a, an employment opportunity or if you sell yourself into a relationship, frankly, for guys and girls, it's just people really are attracted to a healthy sense of self, not necessarily conceit or hubris, but a self-confidence rooted in authenticity and, and genuineness. And so I think that's, that's really the key is put yourself in a position where you're selling something you believe in, whether that's at your job, at your startup, or even as it comes to yourself. When you walk into a job interview that you know you're actually qualified for and you're going to exceed all their expectations, that's a completely different job interview and everyone can smell it on you. And so that's what I'd love to see your audience do with themselves. Yeah, there's, uh, I guess, an epiphany or light bulb that I had had years ago, which is uh, the fact that other people see you as you see yourself. And you, you can choose to see yourself in whatever fashion you want, but that's exactly how the world is going to see you as well. So you have to be super conscious about that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I'm going to assume you you take a look at dozens of opportunities a week. Can you walk us through 
your evaluation process, you know, what's, what is the most important quality that you look for in a founder beside, besides that, you know, inevitable level of, of confidence uh, that you just mentioned? Yeah. I'm, look, I, I do want to emphasize, I took a step back from this business a couple of years ago. So I'm still chairman of the fund and I'm still working on the TV stuff, but, uh, but our business is run and, and our entire deal flow is run day to day by a guy named Matt Mazio. And on, on Twitter, he's at M-A-Z-Z-E-O. I think he's got the same handle on Snapchat and stuff. Anyway, Matt is the guy who's on the front lines making decisions on, we probably see 50 to 80 a day right now in terms of inbound. And most of that is garbage. But but a lot of those are real and deserve some real analysis. We have a few guiding rules right off the bat. So one is the company and what it's doing has to be something we would be proud of and that we would be proud to tell our families, whether it's our parents or our spouses or our our kids, that that's how we made our money. I mean, my wife is a partner in our business and we're raising three daughters and I want them to, to learn about our business be financially literate, but also be proud of, of, of how we made our money. So that's number one, is that it's got to be a business that we can be proud of. Number two is the deal we get into has to give us an opportunity to make real money. I think there are a lot of interesting businesses that we call lifestyle businesses out there that are great businesses for you and your audience to get involved in. There is no doubt. I don't think, you know, I, I, I literally do believe mo money, mo problems, frankly. And I think you know, uh, making a billion dollars comes or two billion or three billion comes with a whole new set of challenges. But I think there are some great lifestyle businesses. I grew up in a small town near Buffalo, New York, where there were guys and gals in our town who had these businesses that kind of they worked pretty hard, but they controlled their own destiny. They had pretty good cash flow. They took good vacations and they lived pretty well. And I definitely uh, look upon those businesses with a lot of respect and reverence. But they're not great businesses for an outside investor like me and my risk tolerance and my expectation for returns. And so we put everything through a filter to see if it's uh, if it's the kind of thing that's going to give us an opportunity to make real money. And then when we start focusing on the founders, we, we look, you know, are these people who we think have had shitty jobs at some point? Literally, I know that sounds funny, but I want to work with people who have had who've worked front of the house in a restaurant or they've prepped food in the back or they've worked manual labor or they've worked in retail, just people have been grinding it out in some thankless job. I think it teaches a lot of humility and it makes it such that in our worst days in our business, we all pinch ourselves and realize how damn lucky we've got it. I also look for founders who have worked, traveled, studied abroad extensively. You know, we really want to work with people who have that humility that comes from stepping out of a subway station in a non-romance language and saying, holy cow, I now materially depend upon help from another human being and I have to trust in the human condition and I have to hope that they're, you know, that they're nice and are going to help me. I just think in parallel, when you study or travel or work abroad or even volunteer abroad, you, you really get exposed to the human condition. And again, certain appreciation. I mean, I, you and I talked about, Charity Water, I've been over to Ethiopia with them a number of times now, and nothing will make you appreciate how damn lucky we have, even just for tap water or toilet water over here compared to a trip to rural Ethiopia. And so those are some of the filters we use to start poking through. When we focus on the product, we focus on, is this a product that we understand? It doesn't necessarily have to be targeted targeted at us as users, but it has to be something that we really understand and we think we understand the dynamics of why and how people would use it. And then beyond that, we have to get comfortable that it's something that we would be able to make better. Uh, by our effort, we would be able to improve the likelihood of success. So we don't do biotech because the last biology I took was in ninth grade. I don't know how to impact the outcomes for those companies. But you bring me something consumer, mobile, wireless, you bring me something that's enterprise, security, retail, you know, there's just a bunch of these things and I'm like, okay, I know how to make that thing better and I know how to increase the likelihood of success and I know how to remove some of the randomness and chance from the equation and make it increasingly likely that we're going to make a bunch of money together. And so these are a lot of the filters that we're putting stuff through. I'll tell you one thing we don't do and that is we do not preordain what, what a lot of people call thematic investing. So I don't 
come up with a theory and say, okay, the shared economy, let's, because what ends up happening is I found with people who have these preordained ideas about what they're going to invest in is they get a pitch that kind of 80% meets their criteria for that space. And yet they feel so much confirmation and so much personal validation that there's a startup up out there that meets their pre-existing theory that they do the deal. And yet the deal isn't incredibly awesome already. And so uh, I see people losing money doing that. And so we try and keep a complete beginner's mind on these spaces. You know, if somebody had come to me and pitched Uber, I, I didn't have any pre-existing theory about the shared economy. I would have never thought that transportation was something that we should be focusing on the year ahead. But as we, as Travis and Garrett and, and my wife and I all started talking about Uber in the earliest days, we knew that we are not just onto something that would upend the transportation industry and the logistics industry and the food industry, but we knew that we were uniquely positioned to do it. And my wife and I were uniquely positioned to help them. And so that's, that's a way of kind of describing our process. Very, very insightful. My brain's just sitting here, here making note of all of this right now. And, you know, a question that I've been looking forward to asking you is if you have a business that is already profitable, should you trade or, you know, sell equity to increase that growth curve, that growth curve? You know, should you take on investment capital and some partners just because you have an opportunity to do that and to, to compress time and capture more of the market or not? Yeah. I mean, look, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule. I should say one other thing. We have no hard and fast rules in our business beyond those guiding principles. So we will do deals whether we get a board seat or not. We'll take a board seat if we think we can be more helpful than anybody else in that room. But normally that's not the case. I think most people out there are better board members than we are. So we don't take those seats. We will do a deal even if we don't own X percent of the company. I see people some of our peers miss out on great opportunities because whether for ego or because they owe an obligation to their other partners, they don't own enough of a percentage of that company. And so we really try and avoid over regimenting any aspect of our, uh, of our business. But wait, what was your question again? Sorry. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting if you have a business that's already profitable. Oh yeah. Sorry. The already profitable. Yeah. So that's it. I don't, I don't like applying bank blanket rules to, uh, to, to any particular business, because I think that's where it breaks down. And man, we, we live in a world of, of every VC, you know, and every entrepreneur offering their blog post of advice. And a lot of that is really helpful. Some of it's dribbled, but, but I would just caution that I don't think there's one rule that applies. That said, every time you let somebody buy your stock, I, I want to encourage you to change the way you think about the phrase. Traditionally, we say as an entrepreneur, you say, hey, look, these VCs gave us money. But almost implicit in that language is that there's something charitable or magnanimous about it. The VCs didn't give you anything. It's not philanthropic. What you did instead was you gave the VCs the opportunity to buy your stock. You gave investors the opportunity to be involved with you. And so I, I kind of want to reset that language because I think it, it starts to imply a little bit more balance in the equation. But if you take it one step further, when you're a founder – you're a CEO, whether you're selling stock to investors or you're bringing somebody onto your company and giving them stock options, you need to ask yourself this question every single time. Is the stock I have left worth more or less by consequence of giving this stock to that investor or to that new employee? You know, in the earliest days of Google, I joined as a pretty mid-level guy and we were courting a, uh, a big hire for the legal group, not even like a big sales guy. It was, we were hiring somebody for the legal group. And by then, by the time I got there, they had realized how much their stock was going to be worth. So they stopped giving it away. So I didn't, I didn't leave Google rich. But what was interesting was in this particular case, we were trying to land this recruit. It was a competitive market. He had other opportunities. And so we had to do everything we could. And one of the other early employees at the company said, hey, can I chip in some of my shares to make his offer sweeter? And we we're like, what? You want to you wanna put in some of your stock options to get this guy to the company? And his name was Colpreet Rana, the guy who offered the stock. And he said, I am wholly confident that the remainder of my stock will be worth more as a consequence of this guy joining. And that will always stick with me. Just the idea that Every single time you have to think about that trade, 
And so back to your question about a profitable business. I mean, there's something really amazing and liberating about a business that's already profitable. I mean, there's nothing more valuable in the world than optionality and knowing it's up to you. It's up to you to make the choice of what to do next. But I don't think there's any hard and fast rule about, hey, do we do we borrow or do we take a bunch of investment to accelerate growth right now or do we just ride this out and grow organically? You're going to find success stories and magazine covers in all those directions. But if that right investor comes along and you think they could be helpful, you know, really roll up sleeves helpful, then ask yourself that question. If I sell this person some stock, will the rest of my stock be more valuable as a consequence? And if the answer is yes, then you know what to do. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. You know, you are a father of three now, three three fairly young uh, you know, daughters. And one of the things that I think about quite often myself as, as a, a father of a six-year-old is, you know, what am I going to teach my son and, and how could I make a positive impact on, on specifically the values that he's going to grow up with and money as well, you know, meaning I grew up in a, a super, super hungry, you know, format and uh, had to go, you know, create the opportunities that I wanted to create. And for him, it's going to, you know, he's going to have some different options. How do you think, how do you and your wife, Crystal, think about parenting when it comes to your, your kids and how you're going to raise them? Yeah, I mean, that's that's really kind of my most important job right now. That's part of the reason why Crystal and I stepped back from the business a couple of years ago is we've got three girls under five and uh, we don't want to phone that in. We want to make sure we're deeply involved in their lives and that, you know, frankly, we've been really blessed to have all this good fortune. And I've seen that with very few exceptions, just screw up families, screw up kids, screw up relationships with spouses. And so we right off the bat wanted to get serious about it. You know, I was lucky to be at Google during one of the biggest wealth creation events in history. And uh, like, like I said, though, I didn't make much money there. I watched what it did to so many people who I think weren't prepared for it. Uh, and I've been around many acquisitions and IPOs since then. And so we wanted to really double down. I too, and as well as my wife, come from, I, I think a hungry situation is a good way to put it, where, you know, there wasn't necessarily a big safety net. And I, I hesitate to even say it because you compare my life to those lives we get exposed to in the developing world and it's cushy. But the idea is, you know, we, we certainly weren't silver spooned and we always had tough jobs and we borrowed the money to go to school and that kind of stuff. And so, we, we struggle with, are we going to put our kids in a position where they have that same kind of hunger and how are we going to achieve that? So a few things. One is particularly raising girls, we want to make sure they're financially literate. So even if they don't go into business, I want to make sure that they are exposed to business, speak the language of business, understand how money and business work. I think that's something that as a culture, we have underserved our girls. And so we're not going to let that happen to our girls and their friends. So we do funny stuff, like starting when they were two and three, we started doing, um, you know, the stock report and we periscope it sometimes where we literally just open up periscope and, and the girls let you know which stocks are green and red and whether that means we're making money or losing money. And it's hilarious. We found that it's mostly other kids and their parents who watch it in the mornings. Pretty fun. You know, I think actually we don't teach girls to negotiate in this culture. We we kind of reward boys for being uh, bold and risk taking and, and pushing the boundaries of interpersonal communication. And yet we don't we don't reward girls for that same behavior. And so we have taught our kids from the earliest days to negotiate that uh, a no doesn't mean a no in our house. You can push back and make me a counter offer every night before we go to bed. I start by saying, OK, there's no books tonight. We're not going to read any books. And they're like, ah, and then they come back with a counter offer. It usually starts at a million. Uh, I'll back one, then they'll counter with 10 and we'll, we'll get somewhere around five or six books before bed. But again, I, we, we really want them to be, uh, to be literate that way. We also want them to be regularly exposed to poor people. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm putting it bluntly, but I want them to deeply understand the human condition and, and to see how they can be helpful and how their generosity would impact people, not just money, but time. We try and put them in positions where they already have quote, I'm using air quotes, jobs and responsibilities. I was lucky my mom and dad sent us to, to start working at 11 and 12, even if it was just for a week at a time with a buddy of theirs who ran a construction company. You know, it was less about the $5 an hour and it was a lot more about 
just understanding how, how hard those gigs are and why we wanted to go to college and study hard. And so we try and get our kids exposed to those responsibilities and building responsibility for them. But there's a lot more. This is literally kind of the primary focus of my time. I want my kids to not necessarily perform at the highest academic levels. That's not my wish for them. I've seen how that doesn't necessarily correlate with the most successful people. Instead, I want my kids to be well-rounded, have a great sense of self, to have a, and a knowledge and of the impact they can have on the world and a responsibility to follow through on that. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a, it's a huge responsibility and, and an interesting puzzle to try to figure out as well, because you, you never know how this other little human being is going to, you know, going to decide to do what they're doing. <laughs> but well, the funniest lesson of fatherhood is how, particularly as a startup guy or an entrepreneur, for anyone listening out there who's going to start having a family, you know, you build your business in the image you want. If something's not right, you just change it. And as I was about to be a dad, I went and interviewed all these good dads I knew uh, or guys I perceived to be good dads, you know, my, my social circle in the business world and stuff. And they all really laughed at my questions because they're like, you don't get it, do you? These kids just come out. They're like formed people. And your job is to help teach them the boundaries and to polish the edges and make sure they're not jerks and to help develop that sense of empathy and generosity and gratitude. But and that's been something that's funny. Three kids, and we have three completely different personalities in this house. And my wife and I laugh, and when they're when they're acting up, we point at the other one and say, hey, they're acting like you right now. But these are three totally, totally different kids under this roof. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, it's cool cool to hear that y'all are down that rabbit hole and that it's a puzzle we all have to figure out, and it's it's absolutely worth uh, you know a game worth winning. To change uh, topics just a little bit here, you are about to, uh, well, you already have, but uh, you're participating in your second season of Shark Tank. And in fact, you've got an episode coming up here on November 11th. So how has that impacted your life, both personally, you know, to be a, a public face and name, if you will now, and then uh, professionally as well? I mean, Shark Tank has been a blast. I, I'll i tell you, I did it less about the public face and name. You know, that I, I, we didn't even really have a TV before we before I agreed to go on that show. And I'd never really seen an episode until I was at a conference and I was flipping channels between a couple of the sessions on CNBC. And all of a sudden I saw like this really crappy pitch for a, it was a combination windshield and feed bag that you put on your kid's car seat. So when they puked, it all collected down in this bag. And I was just, I I was horrified and (laughs) and entertained by it. And so I sent this tweet. I was like, Hey Cuban, Hey Damon, old buddies of mine I'm like are we serious about this car sick bib how about you guys come back to the big boy game okay and um they retweeted that to their followers who just went ape on me i mean they went nuts pitchforks were out i've been on the internet a long time i know what a mob looks like and so these guys i called up cuban i was like what just happened because i mean people were literally writing me like hey they're they're inspiring a nation of entrepreneurs what have you ever done with your life you loser and <laughs> so i called cuban I'm like what just happened there and he said, man, I know. He's like, in the early days when I joined, it was kind of a little hokey. And I was like, kitchen gadgets and stuff. But he's like, what I came to realize is the embodiment of the American dream. You know, this Shark Tank stands for all the social mobility and economic mobility that makes America proud. And so that was one of the inspirations for paying more attention to the show. That still didn't get me on the show. But I started paying more attention and hearing more about it and realizing that it really was, instead of kind of a hokey reality show, it really was a positive force in our culture. And then one thing led to another, and the guy who runs the show is actually a neighbor of mine in L.A., and we ran into each other at a Halloween party, I guess two years ago, Halloween. And we went in for the dad handshake. I was dressed as a bottle of Sriracha. He was dressed as a ninja. And we started talking about the show, and he said, would you want to do it? I said, no way. It's not what I do for a living. And he said, well, what would you do to make the show better? And I just started throwing out ideas and I went home and watched a bunch and did some research and just went deep and, and learned about as much as I could and use that to bring up a bunch of uh, a bunch of insights and ideas that I shared. You know, he invited me in to share those with the Sony team and the ABC team and then ultimately to Mark Burnett's house. And what I didn't realize is that I was reeling myself into it because now after hours and hours of talking about it, I felt pretty emotionally invested. So when Burnett said, hey, we really want you to do the show, I was like, Oh man, I, okay. <laughs> I was like, cause I really want to see it get better. But for me, what's been coolest about Shark Tank is it reminds me of why I got into this business in the first place. You know, I'm, I'm really excited about how successful our portfolio has been in our companies. And 
you know, we have definitely achieved returns that are unprecedented in venture capital. I don't think anyone's ever been even close. But as those companies get bigger and later stage, the politics happen. You know, the knives are out. You got a lot of board issues and stuff. Um, you know, you just you've got conflicts between early investors and late stage investors and you know, maybe the founders being fired or something like that. It's just, there's a lot of blood on the walls, frankly. And in the earliest days of a company, it's just about the product. It's just about really getting to work and making it better and, and placing a bet on whether this is going to be something that people care about. And I miss that. I really did miss that. And so Shark Tank's great because it takes me back to those early stage companies where we get to make real decisions just based on product and team. I'll say the other thing that got me hooked on it though, is that it's the most authentic show on television, period. It's more authentic than the news is, frankly. And I don't know if everyone understood this because I certainly didn't get it from the outside. But, you know, we as the Sharks don't know anything about those companies walking into pitch. We, we get no advance word. In fact, if you have had any contact with them before, you're disqualified from that pitch. We aren't told what to say or what to do. We literally, there is no script. There is no, hey, look. Kevin O'Leary, go ahead and try and say something offensive this time. That's just who he is, frankly. There isn't any quota of certain deals that we have to do or not do at all. In fact, I think the show producers would love to see if there's a pretty good balance between things that get deals and things that don't, because they would just love to see good television result. They'd love to see the audience get educated, and they'd love to see action. If you see a shark fight break out, that's a real shark fight. You know, Unlike a conflict on the Kardashians or something like that, or a bachelor or some show that has a, a you know a mildly scripted arc to it it's it's all authentic the one thing you don't see is that each of those pitches usually takes an hour to an hour and a half where we ask question after question after question and so what they do is they edit that pitch down so that you um you know it it makes 8 to 10 minutes of television but they don't even edit it in a tricky way they show you the authentic pitch there and then the last thing i'd say is we're investing our own money you know we we make um, an immaterial amount of money compared to what we're betting on that show. So we get paid, but I get paid the SAG after minimum. I know Cuban gets paid a little more than that, but I don't get paid much money to be on that show. Instead, it's about it's about the sport of it. And so I'm really proud. I've had a lot of fun doing that show. That's awesome. So so your next appearance is coming up on the 11th. Any any highlights that uh, you think we'll we'll be able to look forward to on that episode in particular? Well. There's a young kid who comes on the show, really young, really young. We'll see how he does. He had he had some strong, strong sales, but uh, see how he holds up. And then definitely I'm looking at the – I haven't even seen – so by the way, I don't get to see the episode until like the day before. And they just give it, they give us the episode so you can be ready to, to live tweet or whatever. But, but I remember the, the fourth pitch of the episode is spicy. Cuban and I really go at nice. each other. Well, I, this won't, is... I won't give you an indication whether we do it or not, but it got it got fiery. Awesome. I mean, look, part of my role on that show is to call BS on Cuban and O'Leary, but particularly Cuban. He's gotten a free ride for too many years <laughs> as the, 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 the billionaire tech guy. So they're like, look, let's bring in another billionaire tech guy to keep him honest. And so the first couple episodes I taped last season, they sat us next to each other and we ended up colluding too much. So now they sat us at opposite ends from each other and we just yell at each other across the panel. And I know at one pitch this season... The rest of the panel just got up and left so that Cuban and I could just yell at each other on an unobstructed basis. That's awesome. <laughs> and those are long days, you know, looking uh, at least what I what I see in Damon's stream. He'll, he'll put up his, his Instagram feed or whatnot. And you guys are taping sometimes 12, 14 hours at a time. Yeah, it's intense. It, and, and we got to keep up the energy that whole time. And the founders, I mean, that's for the entrepreneurs coming in. That might be one of the most important moments of their lives. And we got to remind ourselves at every point how lucky we feel to be sharing that with them. But yeah, I mean, you get, you, the sharks get hungry, they get tired, they start snapping at each other or snapping at founders. I know one of the products coming up on this, uh, on this next episode, I really, really believed in the founder and I absolutely did not believe in his product. Mm. I would have taken this guy and put him in any other business I had, but, and I, you know, I'm not one to pull punches. I was pretty candid about it. Awesome. Well, You've been super generous with with your time with us here today, Chris. How can we best serve you or or help you in any way? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't think anyone's asked me that before. I love it. Well, first of all, it's funny. I don't like make more money or anything like that if more people watch Shark Tank. 
but it is fun. The more people that watch it, the more exciting it is for me because I see them mention it in my tweets. Uh, I try and do this thing for the West Coast feed of Shark Tank where I periscope myself watching the show. I know that sounds funny, but it's like that old show, Mystery Science Theater, where basically you turn on the show at home. I turn on Periscope with myself, and then we do a little live commentary. And if my brother Brian is around or if my partner Matt's around, um, they'll sit in with me and we'll do it. It's kind of fun to be watching the show together. So uh, you can stay tuned for that. It sometimes depends on if my kids went to bed on time, then I'm free to Periscope. The other thing is keep an eye on Charity Water. I think it's important to really keep giving back. And that's the kind of thing where $10 has an impact there. So I'd appreciate if you did that. Awesome. 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 Well, Chris, this was such a, a, a pleasure and a privilege for me. It's so uh, awesome to get a chance to speak to you uh, here in person and, and to have you share your words of wisdom with our audience today. So thank you so much. And how can people connect with you on Twitter so that they can tune into your Periscope feed? Yeah, right on. Well, thank you, Mike. I mean, I'm very flattered to be here. I appreciate you reaching out. I don't do a lot of these things, but uh, when you reached out, we took a look and this 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 was a good fit for the kind of stuff I believe in. And this is a this is the kind of interview I like to give where we talk about stuff that matters, not how to necessarily maximize your email list. So I appreciate that. The easiest place to follow me is just Saka, S-A-C-C-A on Twitter. I'm pretty active there. and I mean, I'm so active there that they rarely show me that while you were away because I've been on it. I've been refreshing over and over again. It's embarrassing, but I'm addicted. <laughs> um, I'm also at Saka on Snapchat. So S-A-C-C-A is my handle there. And uh, who knows what the next social platform will be, but I'll probably, I'll try and use it and, uh, and see how we can use it. But interact with me on, on uh, Twitter and uh, I look forward to it. And real quick, are you going to happen to be at the, uh, the Charity Water uh, Ball on the 5th of December? Uh, I am not going to be because I am doing a bunch of events in Europe uh, trying to help. You know, I think one of the, the United States' big exports right now is entrepreneurship. So it used to be entertainment and soda. And I think now the whole idea that anyone in the world can can start working and building their company is is a uniquely American concept that we're exporting. And and so I I like being an ambassador of that message. So I'm I'm taking that overseas. So I'll be going then. But please enjoy the charity water event. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris, so much. And uh, make sure you go connect with him on Twitter, on Periscope. And man, thank you for your contribution. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you.